High School. A veritable lion's den of judgment, prejudice, and volatile emotion. Countless stories have explored just how daunting these years can be, especially if you find yourself as an outsider just trying to make it through the day. These stories resonate with us because even when we feel we are surrounded by friends, there are many times where we feel like we are still outsiders, especially during such a time when we are still learning how to communicate and connect with one another. With this in mind, this brings us to today's subject, one Stephen King. Put down the liquor, please. We are not engaging in the incredibly dangerous, often deadly drinking game today, as we are not looking at any of the multitudes of television series inspired by his work. Instead, we're looking at the very story that put him on the map of public consciousness, the coming-of-age story that ends in tragedy. Join me, dear viewer, as we piece together the events of The Black Prom on today's episode of Monster Clash. Representing the old, we have the 1976 version directed by Brian De Palma. Representing the new, we have the 2013 remake directed by Kimberly Pierce. Now I know what some of you must be wondering. Am I also going to take a look at the 2002 version? Well, as much as I would love to have a three-way battle royale, I don't feel it's particularly fair to compare what was a television movie and backdoor pilot to two theatrically released films. Not to mention that this would make deciding a winner almost impossible without this video being more than an hour or so long. With that addressed, let's begin with round one. This is another case where the stories of both films are almost identical, as Carrie is one of those stories that's all about building up to one pivotal moment, the Prom Night Massacre. When it comes to the De Palma version, it suffers from the problem of having an inconsistent tone during the film. In the beginning, it tries to pass itself off as a serious, somewhat theatrical drama with a tinge of mystery, as seen during the opening shower incident and the first inkling of Carrie's powers. It keeps this tone for a while until we get to the scene where Miss Collins is drilling the girls in detention. Here, we get a comedic montage complete with a jaunty tune that slows down as we see the girls become exhausted. Given that the early moments of the film had a fairly realistic and dark tone, this felt really out of place, especially when you consider that we're ripped back to the mysterious tone as we see Carrie researching her new powers at the library. The tone evens out after Sue asks Tommy to take Carrie to the prom and pretty much remains consistent for the rest of the film. The tone shifts stay pretty gradual as we build up to the climax of the bucket drop and the ensuing rampage. While not too different from its predecessors, Pierce's version manages to keep its tone consistent from the get-go, and helps set said tone with the prologue that shows Carrie's birth, overly ambitious title card notwithstanding. While the prologue is more or less a character piece, the general eeriness gives a better indication of what kind of film you're going into. Even as we see more light-hearted moments of the story, we are reminded that this is effectively a horror film through some very creepy and disturbing moments that are placed at the right times. One downside here is that some of the build-up to the bucket drop is lost, since the film unintentionally relies on the audience to be already somewhat familiar with the story. Another issue is how the elements that were in the De Palma version were effectively forced into this version, either out of obligation or some sort of loyalty to the source material. This is mostly seen in various lines of dialogue, the subplot regarding Sue's pregnancy, and is especially visible in its own pre-credits jump scare. Thankfully, the ending that we see in the theatrical version wasn't as gratuitous as the alternate ending for this film, which I can't show you since I don't have the Blu-ray version. The biggest difference between these two films is how the characters are handled. In De Palma's version, we don't really get too much characterization beyond what we see for Carrie and Margaret. While Sue is shown to be one of the few quote-unquote good people, we never really get any motivation for her actions beyond a vague notion of guilt. The same could be said for Chris's actions, as we don't really see anything establishing her motivation beyond her meltdown during detention and her exchange with Billy in the scene in which he's introduced. We see that she planned it and enjoys what she did, but we never really see much more than that. When it comes to the side characters that aren't even really named, I get the feeling that the various quirks and motifs were added to make the side characters stand out a little bit. Given their ultimate fate, however, the effort feels almost wasted. They feel more or less like victims of adaptation decay. This is where I think Pierce's film is at its strongest. Not only do we get some good insight into Margaret's character in the prologue, but the motivations of all the key players are addressed and developed. 
While the motivation for Sue to ask Tommy to take Carrie to the prom are the same as in the De Palma version, here we have more of an idea that it didn't come out of nowhere. Instead, it came about as a result of a heated argument with Chris after she was suspended. This shows that she had the time to think and come to the conclusion of what she wanted to do instead of skipping straight to it. Chris's motivations are also made a bit clearer as we see it as more or less a result of misdirected anger. My favorite scene in particular is where Miss Desjardins and the principal are dealing with Chris's father, who is threatening to sue the school if the punishment isn't lifted, only to have it fall apart when Chris is asked to surrender her phone, which contains the uploaded video recording of the shower incident with Carrie. Yeah, it may be a bit of a cliched way for a character to lose, but I find it to be pretty effective. When it comes to Carrie and Margaret, we're given a moderate refinement of what was already given to us in the De Palma version. However, it takes things a bit further when it comes to exploring the relationship they have with each other. Here we see that the two characters genuinely love each other in a weird, twisted way, and we also see the various psychological tics and the behaviors that they have. The only real problem that I see with the story is that it goes out of its way to show how there are some decent people in this community who try to genuinely be good people, which takes away some of the story's weight in my opinion. I'm not saying that all of the side characters have to be completely awful reptilians masquerading as humans, because we've seen what happens when a director makes everybody but the main character and the role being played by his wife into an asshole. What I'm saying here is that it makes what's supposed to be a moment of cathartic revenge into more of a moment of tragedy rather than a moment of horror. It's a tough decision, but when it comes to the story being told, particularly how it was written, I'm going to have to give this round to the remake. The characters are a little more fleshed out, and the tone was consistent throughout the entire film. While both films were made with aesthetics that would be considered contemporary for their respective time periods, this is one case where one film doesn't necessarily beat the other by being better, but rather by having the other film be worse. Let's begin round two. While De Palma's film wears its cheapness on its sleeve, it does have some really strong moments when it comes to its cinematography. First off, look at this shot from when Carrie exits the closet that her mother locked her inside of. Notice how they are framed, with Margaret in the foreground and Carrie in the background. The size and warm lighting indicates that Margaret is the one in control. Carrie is made smaller by comparison, noting her passivity and how afraid she is of her mother. Now look at this sequence where Carrie has revealed her powers to her mother. She is on the opposite side of the frame, but is framed at a medium close-up. The reverse shot onto Margaret has her at a distance, a medium wide shot. Notice how even when she's lecturing Carrie and telling her not to use her powers, she stays distant. Also notice how calm and collected Carrie is as she states that she's going to the prom and that she doesn't want to talk about it anymore. These shots are clear examples of the visuals reinforcing the dialogue in the story. We are being given information without unnecessary exposition or dialogue that points out the obvious. With Pierce's film, I never really got that feeling from the cinematography. Yeah, it could be argued that the red swimsuits on some of the girls is somewhat symbolic, but other than that, there wasn't a particular thing that really jumped out at me visually. The main issue here is that it's shot in a style akin to its horror contemporaries, striving to recreate the magic of the shots of the past without really understanding what made those shots work. The film also suffers from the problem of expecting the CGI effects of the telekinesis to carry it, when frankly, those effects seem pretty laughable. They lack that bit of polish needed to sell the illusion, as everything that's floating looks pristine and clear. It's kind of like watching someone do a drawing of a cartoon character that they like, that they do really good line art, they do really good posing, they keep the proportions right, and it looks really high quality, almost like it was drawn by an actual character designer, only to then have that same artist color it in bright neon colors and glitter. Just because you can make something look flashy doesn't mean you should. When it comes to the bucket drop and the ensuing rampage, here is where you can see the main aesthetic differences in full form. In De Palma's version, you have a very steady, very clear moment of buildup. Sue watches Carrie and Tommy from backstage. She feels the rope being tugged and looks over. Following it up, she sees the bucket looming ominously. She then follows it down, seeing that it goes under the stage. She begins walking over as Miss Collins notices her. Sue follows the rope to the stairs that lead to the stage, pulling the decorations back to find Chris and Billy who don't notice her as they are getting ready to pull the rope. Before Sue can stop them, she's yanked away by Miss Collins, who forces her out of the room. The whole scene plays out like it's happening in slow motion, even though it isn't. It's very analogous to how someone would perceive the event in real life. 
Time may not actually be slowing down, but it feels like it. This works well with the actual slow motion of the blood hitting Carrie, as this is where things are slowing down for her. It's here where we see Carrie going into tunnel vision. She looks around at all of the people and remembering everything they've done to her, as well as communicating the feelings of betrayal and mistrust of Miss Collins and the principal. The kaleidoscope vision may be a bit dizzying, but it helps to communicate a sense of shock, which works in tandem with the edited audio clips. Once the rampage actually starts, things get pretty goofy as we begin the onslaught of gruesome gratuity, complete with laughably goofy looking deaths. What hurts it is a moderately obnoxious split screen effect that persists throughout the scene. When we first see the shots of Carrie moving her head in the corresponding action, I was willing to forgive the film as it mainly shows Carrie unleashing destruction as opposed to a tragic series of coincidences. After that point though, it felt ultimately unnecessary. The Pierce version takes many of the same cues, but lacks the buildup that was present in the De Palma version. There's some buildup, but it feels obligatory, almost like Pierce did it as a formality. This is where we run to the major underlying problem with this version, and that's the fact that it doesn't really do much to differentiate itself from its predecessor. The film never really takes on an identity of its own. After the bucket drops, we don't really get a scene showing Carrie's breakdown, but are instead given a few moments of justification for the violence to follow, which doesn't even really begin until after Tommy's killed by the bucket, implying that that was the trigger that set Carrie off as opposed to having the bucket of blood dumped on her, followed by being laughed at by all of her peers. With the rampage proper, it follows De Palma's lead, but manages to do away with the annoying split screen effect. That said, the destruction is equally as gratuitous, as if the film suddenly remembered that it was supposed to be a horror horror film, and thus had to work in a lot of very painful ways for the students to die at the last minute. This is also one of those scenes where the fakeness of the CGI really breaks the illusion, and approaches an almost Revenge of the Sith level of indulgence. Some things looked good, like Carrie whipping people with live electrical wires, but for the most part, I had a hard time taking it seriously. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, who who thought this was a good idea? I mean, honestly, I mean, the whole, I'm scary, just, no, just, just, <laughs> I, I think I need a minute. I'm sorry, I need a minute. <laughs> okay, okay. I think I got it out of my system. Where was I? Let me see. Okay. Ah, yes, the rampage. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that Star Wars has effectively ruined telekinesis for American cinema. At the very least, it appears that Pierce took a lot of cues from things like Star Wars and a few other sources like The Last Airbender when it comes to how Carrie's telekinetic powers are depicted. That would also explain why some of the destruction is riddled with action movie cliches, right down to Carrie walking away from the exploding gas station with little to no difficulty. Simply put, there's over the top, and then there's just trying too hard. This round was much easier to decide, as you can plainly see. While the De Palma version is cheap in its presentation, when it gets it right, it gets it right. Pierce, unfortunately, just couldn't match that because she put more of her focus on the character drama rather than on the visuals or even the parts of the story that are meant to be horrific. This round goes to De Palma. This last round will not be what you were most likely expecting. Given that it's based on a novel, you're probably wanting me to address which film is more faithful to the original story written by Stephen King. The problem with that is that both films make the same basic deviations from the source material that any other minor differences are negligible at best. So instead, this round will be a battle of thespians as we take a look at the two characters pivotal to this tale of tragedy. What I'm focusing on specifically here is the acting in regards to the characters of Carrie and Margaret White, the two key important characters that are the crux of this story no matter what version you're looking at. Therefore, let's begin by taking a look at the main character herself, played in the 1976 version by Sissy Spacek, and played in the 2013 version by Chloe Grace Moretz. Now, Carrie as a character comes in two main states. The first state that we see throughout most of the film is that of a vulnerable passive loner who's been made to fear the world around her. And the second state? A being of pure rage, of wanton destruction, out for revenge against any and all who wronged her. 
It almost goes without saying that SpaceX manages to strike a nice balance between the two, as both aspects of the character are kept fairly subdued. When it comes to the vulnerability, she pulls it off really well, even if the story of the De Palma version may not handle it as well as it should. What also helps is the fact that SpaceX looks like a misfit. She possesses a very strange look in the way she carries herself, coming across as some sort of alien from another planet. Given how superficial teenagers tend to be, she easily passes off as the kind of person you'd probably avoid sitting next to in class or on the bus. When we see Carrie begin her rampage, SpaceX keeps it subdued as well. The only thing we see moving is her head and her eyes as all hell begins to break loose. Even as she walks through the street after having killed all of those students, she is almost motionless, other than the walking, like a machine. The only real complaint I have is more or less attributed to the theatrical nature of the De Palma version, as there are some moments where we don't really get much of an idea of what she's thinking unless it's spelled out for us via dialogue, or those annoying violin screeches. When it comes to Moretz's performance, she handles the vulnerability of the character fairly well, but this time gives Carrie a moderately optimistic persona wanting to see the good in people despite being told the contrary by her mother. While this Carrie is still sheltered, she also has a clear rebellious streak she tries to display when she can prior to her discovering her powers. That said, I do have to concede to the critics who say that Moretz's turn was more akin to an ugly duckling teen romance film than a horror film. But I find that that may be more attributed to how Pierce handled the story more than anything. The rampaging version of Carrie is the weakest part of Moretz's performance. She's just not that intimidating, and the whole jittery alien thing she was doing just came across as her trying way too hard. That's not to say the film is without good acting moments from Moretz's performance, as there are some scenes where she's actually allowed to carry the scene instead of having her performance tailored to the CGI elements that would be added later. The best scene that shows this is the scene where she's washing off the pig's blood. Notice how she looks like she's in some sort of trance, only to come out of it as she realizes what she's done. This was actually a pretty powerful moment, as we often hear stories of people who have their vision fade into a white light of pure rage, only to effectively awaken to a crime scene. This scene captures that sort of feeling perfectly, and shows some real acting chops from Moretz. Another thing that I feel I must mention is that while SpaceX performance could be considered fairly standalone, Moretz's performance draws very heavily from her exchanges with Margaret, as that's what the film devoted a lot of its time and attention to. Building off that segue, let's now take a look at Margaret White, Carrie's dear mother, played in the 1976 De Palma version by Piper Laurie, and by Julianne Moore in the 2013 Pierce version. Now, I don't really like the De Palma version of Margaret. She comes across as a little two-dimensional, highlighting the negative aspects of the film's theatrical nature. Much of her motivation has to be explained in dialogue rather than shown, and even what bits are shown are made so blatantly obvious that it's almost insulting. We see that she's abusive, and we see that she's a Bible nut, but the film doesn't really give us much more than that until the final moments of the film. Even then, Laurie's performance doesn't come across as particularly sympathetic, which can be argued as being the point, given that the tragic details are revealed minutes before she stabs Carrie in the back. This is something I think the Pierce version handled a little bit better. Not only does the introduction set the tone for the film, but the way Moore plays the character gives us a little more insight into what made her this way. She's abusive, but in her mind it's not from a place of malice, but from a genuine love for her daughter. The main problem is that she's a borderline sociopath who doesn't know how to handle the emotions she's feeling as a mother. This is also what makes the instances of self-harm more believable. It's almost like a nervous tick as her brain searches for some sort of outlet for her confusing emotions. As a result, this version of Margaret is a great deal more sympathetic, but also comes across as generally unhinged. I mentioned how Moretz's performance draws heavily from Carrie's exchanges with her mother. This is almost a similar case with Moore's performance, but when it comes to their scenes together, even when it's not the intended effect, Moore pretty much remains in control, more or less putting forth the fuel that Moretz needed for her performance. Had another actress played the part, I don't think we would have gotten that same sort of chemistry. That said, Moore's performance does overpower Moretz's from time to time, as we have the younger actress coming across as level-headed, even well-adjusted, while the older actress comes across as deranged. Again, that may be in service to the story, but we lose that sense of both of them being misfits as a result of this imbalance in on-screen charisma, which is why a lot of people say that Moore stole the show. I hate to say this, but there's no clear winner here. De Palma's version had a strong carry, but a weak Margaret. Inversely, Pierce's version had a weak Carrie, but a really strong, really intimidating Margaret. 
Honestly, neither one really seems to edge out the other, so I'm afraid this round ends in a draw. I find myself at an impasse, dear viewer. The De Palma version succeeds on the technical front, but doesn't handle the story particularly well. While the Pierce version handles the story better, it doesn't really outshine it on its technical merits. I know that Pierce set out to do a readaptation of the novel, but honestly what we got is basically a retread of the De Palma version with no real identity of its own, the same conclusion I came to when I first reviewed the film during its initial release. While the rounds are tied, this clash is not going to end on a conflicted verdict like I did with Frankenstein. To explain my reasoning, I submit to you this question, dear viewer. What is more important, the way the film is written, or the way the film is shot? At first, you may think the way it's shot is more important. After all, that's what we are seeing, and is the primary way a film tells its story. Some of you may argue that writing's more important, as you need a story to give these images purpose. What it ultimately comes down to is which film uses both aspects most effectively. Which has a strong enough story to support the visuals, while at the same time having those visuals inform the story. That line of thinking makes it pretty clear to me which is the superior film. So, for the first time in Monster Clash history, the winner of this clash is not decided by the number of rounds, but rather by a decision from the judge, i.e. me. I hereby declare the De Palma version of Carrie the superior film. While it's not perfect, it has a richer visual aesthetic that reinforces the story it's telling through its visuals, something the Pierce version failed to do. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the Pierce version is completely awful, it has aspects about it that I like. However, it just doesn't take any of the major creative risks it needed to in order to set itself apart from its predecessor. As such, this clash ends in favor of the old. If it were possible to make an ideal version of Carrie using the elements from these two films, I would take the writing from the Pierce version, the mise-en-scene from the De Palma version, with Sissy Spacex version of Carrie acting off of Julianne Moore's version of Margaret. That said, if I were to personally produce my own adaptation of the story, I would take things one step further, and that would be by incorporating the novel's original ending. Now, it is not a happy ending, but it provides a proper bookend to the story, something that is severely lacking from both films in favor of the obnoxious jump scares. After destroying the high school, Carrie returns home to her mother, who reveals that she was conceived as a result of marital rape. Much like the films, Carrie is in her mother's arms as she begins to pray, only to have her mother stab her in the back. In retaliation, Carrie stops her mother's heart, killing her instantly. Wounded, she exits her house and makes her way to the local roadhouse, a roadside inn for travelers, where her mother was raped. Meanwhile, Chris and Billy are inside, making love, when they receive word about what has happened to the high school and the other parts of the town destroyed during the rampage. They decide to run away to another city and exit the roadhouse right as Carrie arrives. Billy attempts to run her down with his car, only for Carrie to send the car crashing into the roadhouse, killing them both shortly before the blood loss causes her to collapse. Sue arrives on scene and finds Carrie, weakened and dying from blood loss. Despite this, Carrie speaks to Sue via telepathy, first blaming her for the pig's blood prank, only to then see that Sue had asked Tommy to take her to the prom as a way of making amends for the shower incident. This revelation brings Carrie back to her senses as she cries out for her mother one last time before dying. Because of their psychic connection, Sue experiences the feeling of Carrie's death. She then lets out a scream as blood begins running down her leg. She has miscarried her unborn child. I must once again ask, why are people afraid of this ending? If done right, it would properly bookend the events of the story, bring everything full circle, and actually have a satisfying conclusion. It wouldn't be a happy ending, no, but at the very least it would be an ending and not an obnoxious jump scare. S I mean, I just don't get it. Hell, I might just raise the money myself to produce my own version with this ending intact, but I'm getting ahead of myself. You see, dear viewer, this episode of Monster Clash must now draw to a close. The winner has been declared, and now we must move on to our next project. 
Join me next time where we once again enter the world of the paranormal while also entering the world of modern video technology. But for now, dear viewer, good night.